that dates back to the revolution, American Revolution. Imagine having a house up there. You come down and get on the boat every day. How funny that seagull perched up there on the head. Made out of trees. Made out of bark, tree bark. You see it? Sixteen seventy. That guy down in the <coughs> that guy down in the statue built this. Can you believe that? Sixteen seventy. Well, he's in there. Well, yeah. But he built this for people to uh, worship. You want to go inside that church? Yeah. That's pretty, uh, it's pretty darn elaborate. Can you walk up there? No, they got it blocked off. Okay. I ring you, ring your bell with that one. Yeah, it just says do not ring it. That's where you put your offering in. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Got a little money slot in the top. I didn't know that. I don't know. That's a museum. American fur. That was a fur trade. Yeah. These are all folks from this island that served. That started the Civil War. Those people that live on this island. World War II, Vietnam, Korea. World War One, World War Two, Korean, Vietnam, Persian Gulf, Desert Storm, Iraqi Freedom. They trade with the Indians back in the day. Horses everywhere. Look. Mackinac Bridge back there in the background. There's the ferries that we come in over. The lighthouse. place for a fort you can see everything I mean everything the best place to do this would be from the approach to the sword of defense or the back black benches there below this will be followed by our national park walking tour 45 caliber Swamp dress for Trey a soldier the 23rd United States Infantry Company E that would have been stationed here at Fort Mackinac from 1884 to 1890 and during that time the soldiers here would have been acting as the caretakers for the National Park that was headquartered here on Mackinac Island. Mackinac Island, much of Mackinac Island, was the second national park of the United States from 1875 to 1895. Ramrod, send the stuff down the barrel, all that sort of silliness. All the soldiers of the 1880s to do was simply bring back the hammer twice, 
Open the rising breach flood here at the rear of the rifle. Take a brass 45 semi cartridge, which had had a 45 caliber bullet here at top, with 70 grains of black powder, hence the name 4570, with a center fire primer in the rear of the cartridge to light it all up. Insert that cartridge into the barrel, close the rising breech block, bring back the hammer one more time, and they'd be ready to fire. Muslin cloth, as muslin cloth being a cloth-like material, uh, it catches on fire and it smolders. And when we fire this gun, we don't want to launch any flaming debris uh, out into Market Park to ruin any possible romantic couple couples picnic. <laughs> uh, that being said, the next step uh, is to use our wet swab. So this is basically uh, a day out. Now, of course, uh, with the exception of it being wrapped in aluminum foil other than you know muslin cloth, uh, it's still very similar to what they would have used in the 1880s. And it's loaded the exact same way, so uh, Alex is putting it in the muzzle, ramming it all the way down to the breech end of the cannon with the rammer, which is on the other end of the swab. Uh, and from there, he is tapped into place, and his cannon is officially loaded. We're going to wheel it to the firing position. Now, Alex is going to prime the piece. There's uh, a two part step. One is to take the brass spike on the gimlet there and send it down and touch them. This is going to uh, pierce a charge. Yeah, here's a hole in the charge and the breach uh, to make way for our ignition device. Uh, the device we're using to actually ignite the cannon today is the same type of device that we would have used back in the 1880s and even way back into the 1840s. It's what's known as a friction primer. It's essentially a small brass tube filled with gunpowder, uh, but at the top there is a pin uh, running through a chemical called fulminant mercury, which uh, is very susceptible to friction. So uh, when we pull the pin, uh, that amount of friction is enough to spark that chemical, which ignites the powder in the tube, shooting a jet of flame into the charge and setting the cannon off for you all here today. Um, and with the lanyard attached, it is at this time I will remind you all that this is, believe it or not, a cannon. Uh, you might find it rather loud, so I would recommend you either cover your ears or get your cameras ready, wherever your priorities might be. Hey! Fire! That would be a historically accurate misfire. Believe it or not, we are trained professionals, I hope. Um, so we're just going to let the cannon cool down a bit. We're going to re-pick and re-prime it. Um, this was still an issue uh, back in the 1880s. That's the reason why they considered this cannon uh, rather unreliable. Uh, gears, cameras, phones, etc., etc. All right. Two commands left and fire the cannon. They are ready! Alright, we just stopped at a rest. 
rest stop up here around the Alpine Peninsula. Headed over to Wisconsin and into Minnesota. Nice rest stop. Grills, nice bathrooms. I think we're heading to Escanaba for tonight. And then we're gonna get up tomorrow and head into uh, Minnesota and probably down to Wisconsin. Or head over Wisconsin over to Minnesota. We stopped at this nice little park in Escanaba, actually. Escanaba, Michigan. It's actually a big park. It's huge. As far as you can see. We drove all the way over from Michigan, all the way up Michigan and all around uh, Lake Michigan to the north. And we're just in the corner of Wisconsin right now. We're at a gas station. It won't be long. We'll be right on Lake Superior and we're heading to Duluth, Minnesota. So we'll pick you up then. Minnesota, and if you don't think they take camping seriously here, we're down here by the aquarium. Look at this parking lot. I mean, there's people that look like they've been out here for weeks on end. Generators running, everything. Having a dog show at the convention center. That's why all these RVs are out here. So a lot of people have dog crates. They're pushing around dogs and stuff like that. We're gonna head over to the aquarium. Waterfront out there. They're basically on uh, Lake Superior. It's about eight times longer than a human and, about, and stands almost as tall as one. Wouldn't that be shot with a thing like that? Look at the jaws on that thing. So you got, um, it's called a sculpin. And then back there in the back is a white fish. Yeah, I'll show you. Arctic gravy. Yo. Where the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> the uh, strings. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it just looks almost red. Yo. One pair looks below the water and the other pair looks above the water. Let's see. Huh. I don't see no eyes. Oh yeah. They sure do. They have eyes on the side and the the top. That's the first time I've seen a four-eyed fish before. Oh, so what's the name of it? Four-eyed fish. Four-eyed fish. Western painted turtle. It looks like the bottom of the turtle, don't it? Yeah. You know how the bottom of the shell looks? The shell's kind of inverted, yep. It looks like a, yeah, like a, a terrapin, the bottom of a terrapin shell. That's old uh, turkey vulture, isn't it? That one over there? That's what it looks like. And that looks like an eagle. Still in the same spot. <laughs> Mama. Look at him eating. I can't the mouth of that sucker, boy. Yeah, it's kind of magnified, I think, this glass is. Fin on the back there, I just the tail on. You see it like a shark sitting there. Yeah, I do now. There's another one over there too. They go way up there to the top. There's those brown speckles coming like this. 
Oh, that's sturgeon. Sturgeon. Yeah, that's what I got whiskers on like a cat. Yeah. I've seen some big eels, like in the ocean, like morays and stuff, but that's one of the biggest eels I've seen. I don't know, babe. These are called knife fishes. Even though they're electric eels, look at them backing up. He's got a reverse gear. Uh, South America. You see these these piranha piranha fish. Oh, that's the one that eats you, yeah. Yeah, that's that gnaw on you if you're not careful. C and T. Look at the side, you can see see the it looks like a rip saw the sides. They can get up to four feet long. Another, Another reason why I don't swim in the Amazon. Too many freaky looking fish. That fish right there looks like a, almost like a seahorse in the face. Like a lady fish. Look at it. Yeah. They got a very aerodynamic forehead. Uh, yeah, you sit right down there the, on the log, top of the log. It looks like a catfish, is it? I don't know. Huh. That's a lionfish. Red lionfish. It says they can very hardy fish. They survive in a wide range. Environments. If you were swimming and that bumped you on the leg, you, you she almost cracked your pants, wouldn't you? They must like living together. Packed in here. What do you think the second largest lake is? Oh, right over there. Yeah. Longest lake is in Africa. And you can tell, look how big that lake is. That's Michigan. Is it all named after Indians, like the Huron Indians? Yeah, what that thing weighs is. It's heavy, but even me scuba diving, I have to wear probably about 25 to 30 pounds of weight around my belt in order to get me naturally buoyant in the water, so you don't float to the top or you don't sink to the bottom. Get up, they get bigger than Volkswagen in the, in the ocean. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, there's a guy down in the um, that runs a brewery down in the mountains. He was telling me he's a Navy diver. Yeah. He said they used to get out and they would they would walk into their mouths. They were so big. There was nothing there with a That is weird. Can you imagine swimming in the ocean and that thing swim up to you and look in the face? You're like, what is that? Does it sting? Does it what? What does it do? You can get by anybody there. Got the house up there. We're here on the uh, riverfront in Duluth. Bridge. You can't see it from here, but. When you look at it, in the binoculars you can see some pulleys and cables so I think that bridge goes straight up instead of swinging out maybe yeah look it's going up it ain't a cruise ship but it's big <laughs> <laughs> 